Okay, thank you all for joining us to learn about the making of Exquisite, a luminous and inspiring book, which the American Library Association awarded a Cybert Informational Book Honor and a Coretta Scott King Honor for illustration. Gwendolyn Brooks is known for her poems about real life. Exquisite follows Gwendolyn from early childhood into her adult life, showcasing her desire to write poetry from a young age. Gwendolyn Brooks was the first Black person to win the Pulitzer Prize, receiving the award for poetry in 1950. And in 1958, she was named the Poet Laureate of Illinois. She was a bold artist who from a very young age dared to dream. Brooks will inspire young readers like you to create poetry from their own lives. So I hope all of you have had a chance to look at Exquisite. If you haven't, um, you can get a copy at the library. And at the end, I'll explain some places where you can purchase the book locally. So I'm going to introduce to you uh, the creators of Exquisite, Suzanne Slade and Cosby A. Cabrera. Suzanne Slade is the author of more than 150 books for children. Isn't that amazing? Uh, she's a mechanical engineer by degree. She often writes about STEM topics as well as fascinating figures in history, like Gwendolyn Brooks. Her thorough research on her subjects and her understanding of what facts will interest children makes each of her books a fascinating experience. Her newest book, Blast Off, How Mary Sherman Morgan Fooled, Fueled America Into Space, is the inspirational story of Mary Sherman, the world's first female rocket scientist. And you can find out more about her and her books on SuzanneSlade.com. And the illustrator of Exquisite is Cosby A. Cabrera with us today. She was born in Brooklyn, New York, to parents who were born in Honduras. A former art director, she creates and illustrates picture books for young readers. In addition to writing and painting, she loves working in textiles. Her handmade dolls or muñecas are collected around the world. To see samples of her art and learn more about her books, visit Cosby at Cosby.com. Hi, friends. So let's learn about this book. I'm going to spotlight your screen, Suzanne, because you're going to start, correct? Yes. OK. Take it away. Well, thank you, Andrea. I'm excited to share a little bit about how, how Cosby and I created Exquisite. And I'm gonna share my screen to show you. And there we go. And what is fun on this is um, the beautiful young woman up in the corner there that is Cosby's daughter as she is um, reading book. Okay, I want to just do one thing real quick, and that is make this smaller, just so you don't see that. Okay. So as the author of a book, a book always starts with something invisible. It starts when I get an idea. And the idea for Exquisite came in 2013. That's like nine years ago. <laughs> and it was when I was down at the University of Illinois, down in Champaign-Urbana, and they had a big poster up saying that they were going to be getting the archives of Gwendolyn Brooks, the poet. And by archives, that means the poetry journals that when she was young, a young girl, teenager in her 20s, she would write her poems in, in those journals like the one you see here. And they even had every lots of things she wrote, like grocery lists. And so, I thought, wow, I have always loved Gwendolyn's poetry. Wouldn't it be wonderful to write a book about her? So after I get an idea, then I have to think about the idea. I have to evaluate it and decide, is this a topic that I think will inspire others? I can't read my own slide. <laughs> um, and I decided yes, because um, Gwendolyn is a phenomenal poet and she overcame many challenges to pursue her love of poetry. And as mentioned before, she was the first black person to win a Pulitzer. So it definitely passed my first checklist item. Then I said, am I very invested in this topic? And I decided, yes, I am because Gwendolyn is from Chicago, my hometown. And I knew she had sponsored writing contests and taught. She was a very giving person. She was an amazing person and I adore her poetry. So I knew that I was invested because 
once an author starts with a book idea, they'll be with it for a long time. And with this book, it was seven years from when I got the idea until it was published. And did I think others, see, I can't read, I, your request is over my um, writing. Um, did I think it would inspire others? Oh no, were there other books on the topic? Okay. No, there were not any books about Gwendolyn Brooks and I couldn't believe it. Now there was this book called Bronzeville for Boys and Girls that had her poems in it. And it's a wonderful book of poems that children would enjoy. And so the last thought question I ask myself is, are there great um, resources, primary resources about her so that I could really dig in and learn a lot about her to write a great story? And yes, there were. Uh, there were the, the journals or handwritten journals that I told you about earlier that were down at the U of I library. She had written two autobiographies that I could read her writing about her own life. And as I was working, as I began thinking about this, I was meeting people like Taimba Jess here. Taimba was a poet who won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry in 2017 for Olio, but he had entered some of the poetry contests that Gwendolyn sponsored and he had met her and talked to her so I could talk to Taiba about um, Gwendolyn. So I knew if this book checked all the items, so I was ready to go with step two, which is research. So of course I contacted the U of I library and I said, I wanna look at Gwendolyn's handwritten journals. And they said, well, not yet. <laughs> because uh, they hadn't cataloged all of her poetry journals. So I had to wait. But in the meantime, of course, I could begin with all of the other items I told you about. I read both of Gwendolyn's autobiographies, and they were amazing. And then uh, what I did was I bought my own copies so that I could mark up the books and I could Mark the things that I thought were really important um, that children, readers would want to learn about because an author, author will learn so much about a, a subject, but they can only put a small amount in the book. So I marked up the things I really wanted to share about Gwendolyn. And of course, I read other books, other biographies about Gwendolyn. And I went back and reread a lot of her her own her poetry so that I could really get a feeling for her voice and her words. Then I found some wonderful interviews uh, where Gwendolyn was telling about her life and her inspirations. And one great interview was in an Ebony magazine, July 1968. And in that magazine, she talked about as a young girl sitting on her back porch and looking up at the sky and watching the beautiful clouds go by. And she said that she knew she was dreaming about her future, which was going to be ecstatically exquisite, just like those clouds. And that's when I knew from Gwendolyn, Gwendolyn's own words, the title was going to be exquisite and the theme would be about clouds because she really loved clouds. And actually in the book, we were able in this beautiful scene that Cosby painted of Gwendolyn sitting on her back porch in Chicago, looking up at the clouds, we put the actual quote of Gwendolyn's there in the book. So I love that some of her words are in the book. Now, it was time that I, the third step was you get writing and revising. So I began writing, um, what I wanted to include from her life. And you see all the changes I make. Uh, an author spends probably 20% of their time writing and 80% of their time changing it and revising it. Here you see many of the versions I would, I put numbers on just so I could kind of keep track as I would, I didn't print every version, but you see, I think I'm up to 13 or something here. And even, um, this before, as I was writing, before I found that interview where she talked about the exquisite clouds, you see, I even had other titles like Up in the Clouds, The Poetic Genius of Gwendolyn Brooks and Poems, Beats and Rhythms of the Streets. I just was trying out different titles until I came across her words of exquisite. So 
as I'm re writing and revising, finally in 2015, two years after I've been working on this, University of Illinois Libraries said, okay, we're ready. You can come down and you can look at Gwendolyn's journals. And so I went down and they had big banners announcing, you can see these pictures of Gwendolyn, these literary papers at the Rare Book and Manuscript Library. This is very exciting. So I walked in and they had me sign in and I had to put special gloves on and they had all of her poetry journals. And I said to the curator, I said, have you found a poem she wrote about clouds? Because that's the theme and I haven't found any other poems in books about her. And they, she said, no, I haven't seen any. And so she said, now you can look at one journal at a time. So I selected one journal. I opened the cover and would you believe the very first poem I see is titled Clouds and I'm not kidding. <laughs> and I was stunned, I was amazed. Um, I was very excited as you can see. <laughs> it was just a confirmation for me that this project was really going on the right path. So not only did I find the poem about clouds, but I found all these other poems um, that Gwendolyn had written at various ages. Many of them had never been published before, including clouds. So no one could read them. And so I worked with uh, Brooks Permissions. They own all of Gwendolyn's poetry, her early poems. And we got an agreement where we could put Gwendolyn's poem that she wrote at age 15, her clouds poem in the book. So for the first time, people could read this beautiful poem, which is so exciting. So as I'm moving along, now it's time. My story, I think, is finished. And I now started to submit it to publishers. As we know, publishers are the people who make the books. And Abrams Books for Young Readers loved the story. They really were inspired by Gwendolyn Brooke and they agreed to publish it. And this was in 2016. And so uh, I continued, uh, then they looked, started looking for an illustrator and the next year Cosby said she would illustrate it, which was very exciting. And so at this point, I will continue working with the editor, but Cosby then begins her own journey of research and work to bring the words to life. Now, Cosby, are you able to share? I, I think you have to stop sharing. Yeah, and that's what I can't. Um, oh, yay. There you okay. go. Hey, all right. <laughs> now. So thank you, everybody. Thanks for being here tonight, right on a Monday. And um, thanks for having us. Andrea at the Wilmot yeah, Public Library. Uh, we're just so excited to be here, Suzanne and I. Uh, so let's see. Uh, I think this is where we want to be. And let me know if you can see that okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So again, back to the archives. <laughs> and so this is a page out of her um, out of uh, her journal. And let's see. Hmm. Yeah. And I did find the poem Clouds. Um, and, you know, when I found it, I didn't understand the significance of it, except that it was, in fact, in the manuscript. And little did I know that it had never been published before. Um, but I began to work on the, um, the sketches for the book because I received the manuscript, which is all of Suzanne's beautiful po uh, prose that is typewritten and double spaced. And so my job, of course, is to see how these, how I could create um, scenes, um, you know, so that we can turn the page and follow the story along. Um, so I submitted some things um, and then you get to a point sometimes where you can't find anything, not even on the internet. And so that's why it's so great to go to, um, to the, the University of Illinois um, Rare Book and Manuscript Library. And that's where I was able to find this picture of Gwendolyn Brooks. <laughs> now I'm having a problem here. <laughs> it's not budging. Oh no. Any yeah. tips, Suzanne? 
<laughs> what I finally did was instead of pushing the arrow buttons, I finally clicked on my mouse. I right, a uh, left clicked, which I've never done. And there you go. Got it. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you can see here, uh, this is Gwendolyn Brooks, and it's the only picture that I ever found of her as a child. Um, and I had to submit some things before I even found this picture. So I had to recreate her face from an adult using childhood uh, proportions, you know, and we know that most children's, when you look in a classroom of kids, you'll notice that most of their eyes are sort of in the middle of, this, of their, their face. Um, and so most of our features when we're children sort of happen sort of below the midpoint. So foreheads are a little larger because all the features have to grow into our skulls. And so I found this picture of Gwendolyn with her brother Raymond on the tricycle, and I was so delighted by that. Um, so I, but prior to finding that picture, I had to create a cover. Um, and so I try it many different ways. This is me sketching in pencil, which is always the first step, uh, trying some things that are a little literal, like, you know, spot on and others that are a little more uh, metaphorical, a little more poetic. But one of the things um, that I remember was a quote from Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, that Suzanne was so good to share in her manuscript and said, poetry comes out of life. Um, so I had her as a little girl looking out her window, perhaps observing her neighbors, um, because she was inspired so much by the stories of the people around her in life. And then I sort of settled on this um, picture on the right-hand side. And something about the tenderness in her expression that I decided I would go and paint. So I painted it, I submitted to the publisher, everyone was thrilled and excited and delighted. Um, and then as we were still delivering on the art, another book, which had not existed, came out that was a, a children's picture book about Gwendolyn Brooks. And that beautiful book also had a pink cover. So the publisher said, there's no way we can have, after there not being any books about Gwendolyn Brooks, two books <laughs> that have pink covers. Um, and sure enough, uh, they sent the, uh, the art back to me. <laughs> and so I went ahead and I painted over some of that pink there to have some of the blue show through. Um, and it reads as a blue sky with blue clouds. Um, so, I, you know, one of the, the facts, you know, is that, you know, uh, Gwendolyn Brooks read voraciously as a, as a little girl. And um, there were books in her home and her father had gifted this um, Harvard's classics to her mother as a wedding present. And we knew that it sat in a mahogany um, bookcase. So there's some things that we have the facts on and other things we sort of have to fill in the gaps visually. We also know that her dad was an amazing orator and loved to read um, poetry out loud at night. And Gwendolyn, as Suzanne had said, loved nothing more than to hear her father's rich and booming voice, you know, reading out loud. And so what we listen to really does have an effect on us, right? So that's why we want a little bit more than the TV <laughs> as the voices in our home. You know, it's so great to read from our books out loud. And so um, at the library, I was able to locate her journals as Suzanne had before um, me, but I didn't know what Suzanne had found. I'm sort of like doing my own little um, treasure hunt, you know, myself. Um, but one thing I was able to learn um, because Suzanne had made a reference to her big hugging aunts, you know, and so I learned that, so, um, that Gwendolyn was very much loved by her aunt Gertrude and Beulah and Ella and Epi, and they really did have an impact on her. Um, you know, she felt surrounded. And so we knew that she was loved. We knew that she read. She, we knew that she heard um, words out loud. And we also knew that she wrote from a very tender age. So I have her with all of her writings and her revises because Suzanne said that her room became a swelling sea of poems. 
And so, of course, you know, in our lives, there are things that we kind of do really well naturally. That doesn't mean that we stop there. You know, we have to cultivate still and refine our, our, our skills, even if we have a talent, right? And so Gwendolyn's mother, um, Keziah, noticed that Gwendolyn uh, actually was able to construct and, and compose poems at this early age. And this is a scene where Suzanne has her mom um, sort of indicating that she might be the next Paul Lawrence, Lady Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And Gwendolyn was so happy to hear that because that was really one of her favorite poets. And you know, there were little obscure pieces of writing that said maybe in interviews that um, her dad, Gwendolyn's dad had built her, um, David had built her little red desk and had gifted that to her. So I have that in the, you know, behind the, the mom, you know, and there, there are little things that I had to pluck out, you know, I was able to put some of the family photos um, on their wall, you know, but like the little detail of, hmm, I want to put her mom in bedroom slippers. So I'm like searching for bedroom slippers from the 1920s and nothing showing up because of course they were called house shoes back then. And if you didn't know that, you didn't know that you didn't know that. <laughs> so I have Gwendolyn at the piano because I knew her mom was a piano teacher and more than likely it would not be um, uncommon for Gwendolyn to be practicing as well. Um, and so, you know, here I have them representing this period of time that was their inflection point in history. You know, I was asking some kids the other day, what's your inflection point in history? And they said, COVID. <laughs> and then some of them said the war. And I said, the war where? They said, in Ukraine. And I said, who has heard of Ukraine prior to the war? You know, very few hands went up there. So like to be aware of our inflection points, Gwendolyn's inflection point in history, that sort of critical time that sort of changes destinies and outcomes, you know, things are going along fine one day and then things change. And for them, it was a great depression. Um, so I have them eating sort of a meal of beans as Suzanne had indicated. And I decided I was gonna put some cornbread because I knew they had migrated from the South and cornbread is very much um, sort of a Southern staple. And so here it is, right? This is the sketch that Suzanne had mentioned about her sitting in the back porch, you know, and I go and I sort of like fill in some of the details a little bit and then I go to finish, right? So it's very much a process of, figuring things out, placing things um, in space, allowing room for the words, and also um, getting to some semblance of polish, hopefully not too much. And clouds, right? Clouds were everywhere um, it, because the, the theme just uh, from the beginning, you know, like here in our title page um, where we have the title exquisite, you know, it's like all of these sort of houses that you might find in Brownsville, those limestone buildings, you know, and these very light pink clouds. I don't know if you can see that. So I was looking at clouds everywhere I went at every time of the day, even when I was traveling, even if I was in another country, I was looking out in the sky because when you read the sky this way, you realize there's no one sky. That's why when I ask kids, what is the color of sky? Sometimes they'll say blue. And I, I beg to differ. I think the color of sky is sky <laughs> because it really does vary. So all throughout this like really difficult time that they were experiencing when she didn't even have food to eat, Gwendolyn persisted. She continued to write because she really was um, perfecting her craft. This is my daughter on the on the left hand side, and um, you know it's like I wanted her because I wanted to show Gwendolyn blowing out her candles on her eleventh birthday, but also sending her words out into the world, as Suzanne said. Um, and so the flames turn into paper, and so I asked my daughter to sit there, throw her shoulder forward a little bit, blow, <laughs> and cross your fingers as if you're hoping that your words might be accepted in the world. Um, and as artists, we pluck and we pick things that move us, that touch us in some way. And so this is for my scrap bin. You know, I love that little ribbon motif there. And I love that 
floral and all of the colors. And I decided to bring it into that scene so that the, um, that ribbon motif is now on her birthday hat and, you know, the tablecloth is the floral and there are those papers out into the world. And sure enough, she was in fact published at their early age at, from the Chicago Tribune and then also from the American Childhood Magazine. And as artists, we also borrow from our personal experiences. I grew up in an urban environment um, and it was not uncommon for the little girls to play double dutch in a schoolyard with two ropes. I don't see that out here in Illinois so much. Um, although I did see some grown women in Chicago proper in the middle of these skyscrapers on the sidewalk jumping um, double dutch and they were in their 40s and 50s and some were even in their late 60s and early 70s. Um, but I remember I was no good at this at all. Um, I couldn't turn alternately in rhythm and I was uh, dubbed double-handed and no child ever wants to be called double-handed because then nobody wants you to turn rope for them. And there was no way I was gonna jump into those moving ropes. <laughs> and so I just was awful at it. So I used that experience, um, you know, because Girls, um, even in high school, were jumping rope in Chicago back in those days. And I would imagine that Gwendolyn was probably no good at that either because she wasn't so athletic. Um, so I have her passing by the line, you know, holding her books. Um, and then I have to decide, okay, how am I gonna dress all the people that are on that double Dutch line? And so I just do some random color mixing and matching and patterns and, there we have it in the translation. And that's that jump rope scene before it's completely finished. Again, you know, she's stringing her words, right? Um, I asked my daughter to, once I figure out what I want her to stand like, I asked my daughter, could you do that for me? And sure enough, <laughs> and that's that here, which is, you can see that, this one. <laughs> And so I have Gwendolyn sending her words out to a publisher in New York. Um, and I'm like, okay, I'll have her put the letter in the mailbox. And then I have to ask myself, well, what did mailboxes look like in the 40s? And sure enough, they were not freestanding like we have today. They were usually uh, affixed to a truncated lamp post um, or possibly even a lamp post. And so that finding that out, I had to then go ahead and represent that. And so here we are. Um, and so looking at her journals, I noticed that she used bound notebooks. She also um, loved to write in her own scripted hand and she typed some things as well. Um, with little notes here and there. And most of her papers had this round, these rounded corners and the three hole punch. And I finally was able to locate a picture of her husband because nothing showed up on the internet or any books that I, I was looking through. Um, and so then I felt like I could paint them freely. So this is me representing their wedding day. There's no wedding photo, um, but there was an obscure reference that she had purchased a dress for $15 and it was red and that's what she wore in her wedding. And her aunts provided a tall cake with fresh and beautiful flowers. Um, and so that's it on my table on the right. And then I can go in and fill in some of my, my details and feel free to represent him, even though I'm not showing his face. You know, I've got his jawline and sort of an accurate enough representation that it's not like, oh, where does that come from? And so we knew that the wedding was also held in your home. So there's that mahogany bookcase again. So, you know, there were housing covenants um, in Chicago in the night in, uh, you know, the early 20s and 30s and 40s. And so it was not uncommon that there was a great migration from the South, you know, um, uh, called the Black Belt at the time. And so people were coming in and um, oftentimes um, with the housing covenants, you couldn't just like move in anywhere you wanted to. You could only move into a certain like um, mile radius. And so it was not uncommon that um, actual buildings were divided up into these tiny little kitchenettes. And that's where uh, Gwendolyn lived um, 
with Henry when she got married. She moved into a tiny little kitchenette and you shared the bathroom with your neighbors. Uh, so it was not uncommon even, you know, your laundry <laughs> to like wash by hand and hang up to dry right where you are. You know, these are some of the reference pictures I, I plucked out. And so that's how I was able to, you know, formulate this, you know, with her again, writing at her kitchen table, you know, with her son. And so sometimes I have to select a palette. You know, this is a very difficult time in her life where her lights are out <laughs> and she's riding still. And so I wanted to represent these as grays, but how do you make gray still appealing and somewhat beautiful? Um, so I just sketch a little bit, you know, color sketch on the left there and insert it. You know, same thing for that uh, scene in the uh, communal bathroom where she goes uh, because she's gotten this letter from the publisher after submitting all of her material. And what is the publisher going to say? Will they, in fact, like her writing about people in your neighborhood? Suzanne questions in the book. And sure enough, <laughs> they do. So this is it sort of, you know, little by little filling in the gaps. You know, um, I took some regular loose leaf paper. I three hole punched it. I cut around for the corners. Um, and just to see when I lay them out, what happened with the shadows? And I dyed these with coffee, um, you know, and um, uh, blue pencil lines. Uh, so that I can then sort of reflect some of her papers. I lay them out to see how they would, uh, in fact, interact with some of the things I was painting. And then I go ahead and I layer it in. And that's where we get that. Yeah. And again, her journals. This is an entry, um, you know, she has won the Pulitzer Prize and she's saying, oh my gosh, I need to make a list of all the people I need to call and, and think. And then it says here at six o'clock, <laughs> let me see if I can get rid of this. Yeah, at six o'clock called by Jack um, Starr, a star reporter of Chicago Sun Times who said, congratulations. I said, on what? He said, you have just won the Pulitzer Prize for poetry. I screamed, I didn't. <laughs> and that's where she goes into dancing with her, um, with her son. Here, let's see if we can click on there. There we go. So I have them um, sort of in their apartment, um, you know, and then I found this picture of Gwendolyn and I wanted to put her in this dress and I just imagined that maybe that was red piping. <laughs> and so that's how we formulate that. And of course we end with a sky full of clouds. There we go. Again, one of her journals. Yeah, and this is some of her, her writing in her hand at the table, some of her sketch um, books. Um, for memories and there we have it. And that's it. And I'm gonna stop sharing here and we're gonna go back to Suzanne. Thanks Cosby, that was so interesting. I learned something new every time you share. That is just fascinating. Okay, so yes. Yeah, so what I just wanted to finish up with was with now that the book released in 2020, um, as an author and illustrator, there have been some fun surprises, um, some of the awards that the book has won. And for Cosby and I, I don't think it's so much that the book has won awards, but what's most exciting to us is that means more young readers like this little girl are gonna find the book, are going, it's gonna be out on a shelf and they're gonna learn about the inspiring life of Gwendolyn Brooks, which I hope inspires them to go after their dream because Gwendolyn always loved poetry. I think she began writing at age six. It was a passion of hers, it was a dream. And even though she faced many obstacles, she kept going after her dream. And that's what I hope Gwendolyn's story will inspire other young readers to go after their dreams. Some other fun surprises was that the, it's called Eduham. It's a read along with the cast of Hamilton. And um, this is Crystal Joy Brown. She played Eliza on um, Broadway and she did a reading which you can see online. Yeah, her family owns great 
there's that bookcase that Cosby painted. Another fun surprise is that the Chicago Symphony Orchestra did a musical reading. I'll let you see a little bit of this. And you can see how hard they even animated some of Cosby's art. Her mother found those scribbly lines and announced with sincere conviction, as mothers do when making a prediction, you are going to be the lady Paul Lawrence Dunbar. <laughs> so that's just really fun, uh, I think, for Cosby and I to see when your book um, takes on life in new ways and new ways that children can experience it. So that's kind of a little bit about the story of how we created the book. And so now we wanted to see if anyone had any questions for us. We love to answer any questions about creating the book or research or anything you'd be interested to know about. Yes, and everyone, you can type your question in the chat if you like, and I'll read it. Um, or you can unmute and ask your question. And maybe people want to think for a moment. I have a question. Um, can you tell us what you're working on right now or what new work we, we should be looking out for? Suzanne? Okay, well, um, I think Andrea may have mentioned a little bit that my next book, and it comes out tomorrow, it releases tomorrow. It's about um, a woman named Mary Sherman Morgan, and she loved science. Um, I'm an engineer by degree, so sometimes I write about science, but this is about a girl who actually developed the fuel for the first rocket that the U.S. put up that launched our a satellite called Explorer One, and it studied space. So I have this book and about two others coming out this year. But while we're talking about other books, um, I kind of have my Chicago books, of which um, Gwendolyn is one, our beloved Gwendolyn Chicago. But I also have some other Chicago notables. For example, did you know the Harlem Globetrotters? Uh, they began in Chicago. Uh, high school players at Wendell Phillips High School in Chicago would they be became the first Harlem Globetrotters team, and they actually used the word Harlem because they thought it would make them seem more interesting, that they were from um, this neighborhood that, that people knew a lot about. And my other Chicago book is Dangerous Jane about Jane Adams. If you've heard of Hull House downtown Chicago and how Jane helped all of her neighbors around Hull House um, from different countries. And so these are just some of my other Chicago stories. Cosby, how about you? What do you have coming up? I, I love that. You know, I saw the uh, Harlem Globetrotters as a little girl um, at Madison Square Garden, and I'm sure my mouth was shaped like an O the entire time, but I didn't know that they were from Chicago. <laughs> um, so I, um, I have uh, Edna Lewis uh, that's coming out at the very beginning of 2023. I know it feels like it's a long way off, but imagine we're in April already. That happened really quickly. Um, and I also have a, a book that's um, written by um, Leslie Honoré called Brown Girl, Brown Girl, uh, that's coming out the same year. Um, and then I've got a lot of things on my painting table now um, that will actually um, be out in 2024. And so it's not uncommon for publishers. I know it sounds really odd to work so far in advance, you know, um, but like, for example, Gwendolyn Brooks, um, it was ready before April of 20, what is it, 2020, Suzanne, or 2019? We released in 2020. Yeah, it was ready before then, but the, the publisher was adamant that it should come out um, during National Poetry Month. So they were willing to sit on, on it and wait for a little bit just so that it could be released during that time. Um, so yeah, so a lot of the books that you're reading, actually, um, there's a lot that happens beforehand, way before it actually is available on the shelf. Thank you, it's very exciting. Ms. Solar, did you have a question? No, I wanted to say something. I taught fifth grade years ago, and I used to use Gwendolyn Brooks' Bronzeville Boys and Girls oh, wow. as examples. And one of my children won a Gwendolyn Brooks prize for poetry. 
Oh, wow. That's amazing. Wow. That's amazing. You know, Gwendolyn was a very generous person as Suzanne alluded, you know, it, she, even though um, <laughs> she lived very modestly, you know, it's like she wasn't out buying fancy furs. <laughs> or diamond rings or any of that. She she literally took her resources and, you know, if someone was in trouble, she would help them, you know. And one thing that was really important for her, you know, as um, Anne Salar has mentioned, um, is that children be given the opportunity um, to be encouraged in their writing and creating. So it was not uncommon for her to take her own money, you know, put together um, a contest and award the winner you know, with a, a cash prize. So congratulations on your student. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Susan, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. I, I just, firstly, I wanted to tell you, I so much enjoyed both of your uh, discussion and, um, and looking at this beautiful book, Exquisite. It's, it's really wonderful. Um, my question is to Cosby. Which artists have influenced you? I mean, there's probably been a lot. I see a lot of different, but do you have a favorite, a couple of favorites? Uh, um, you know, I, I think that changes as I, as I move along, you know. Um, I, I've always loved the, um, as a beginning painter, love the work of Diego Rivera, you know. Um, and still do, um, you know, I just saw the, <laughs> the Frida immersive, it, it seemed a little commercial to me. Um, and I went into the gift shop hoping I could find something of hers, but they only had the more, um, you know, uh, familiar uh, images. Um, and then I, I went into, um, oh gosh, there's someone named Igshan uh, Adams, who's now showing at the Art Institute. Um, um, and I absolutely love his work. It's called Desire Line. So if anyone's uh, available to see that, it's definitely worth seeing. It really stirred and moved me. And that's not painting. Um, and I'm just now becoming acquainted with his work, um, but it, it does touch me. So I, I, do, I do look for things that stir something in me emotionally, you know, and in my training, I, I, I was always taught, you know, doesn't even matter how amazing you are, um, you know, in terms of your, your virtuosity, you know, it's like, you know, are you able to rearrange emotional furniture, you know, through your work? And sometimes that happens in the most of uh, sort of like even some folk art can be very moving, you know, and um, yeah, it's like touching the heart, you know, and so like anything that I see that that stirs me or stirs my heart, I am very much drawn to. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, yes, it does. I, I find art very stirring also. So many different artists stir yeah. my heart too. And yeah. your book, Exquisite, stir, stirs it. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's all we can hope for, right? <laughs> yeah. Looking for more questions. I have a question. I, can, I wanna ask you, Cosby, about one of the features that I admired so much in the book was that the um, Gwendolyn's um, throughout her, the different ages, her head is often portrayed as tilting up to the sky. Could you speak to that, that choice? I always, it looks to, to me, it always gave me a sense of hopefulness yeah. and pride, but yeah. um, what, what, yeah. what were you thinking when you positioned her that way? Um, I, I was thinking about um, Suzanne's poll quote, you know, that she did find in that article, you know, um, that she was in fact looking forward, you know, mm -hmm. um, not even to her immediate circumstances, because we know that there are dips and dives in that, you know, um, uh, but, she, you know, she, she really did look to the future, you know, and so her head tilting up, you know, just like even looking at the clouds, you know, mm -hmm. it's this, this idea that we are not just our immediate circumstances or limitations, you know, but we, we are something a little beyond those things. Yeah, I really, I found the way you both portrayed her to be very inspiring, you know, because you portray her struggles in, in a, in a realistic way, you know, but she has such a sense of dignity in the way you, you painted her and persistence. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, any any illustrator that's given a, a manuscript of beautiful 
prose <laughs> is essentially given the best of gifts, really, um, because it, it really does inspire. There's so much you can pluck out um, when something's written so beautifully, you know? Um, and that's what I, I noticed right away. I don't normally do a deep reading of a manuscript because um, I, I don't want to start forming images before I can capture them. Um, so I usually do sort of a cursory read. Um, and the first thing that I, I recognized with the, with the prose was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. It is. You two are just a dream team. <laughs> <laughs> you think you'll do another book together? We, we have talked about it. We haven't come up with a, actually I've been giving it more thought just recently, um, Cosby, but I know it, it's funny because as she says, your projects are so far out. Like I have books out to 2024 as well. And so it, you kind of have to ramp up early, but um, I would I would very much like to do another book with Cosby. Yeah. So we just have to get our heads together and make a little space to brainstorm ideas. <laughs> I would love that, yeah. Does anyone else have questions for Suzanne or Cosby? Don't Last be shy. Chain. Don't be shy. <laughs> Any budding writers or illustrators in the group, I wonder? And again, you can put it in the chat if mm -hmm. you don't want to speak up. Yeah. <laughs> it's not uncommon to be shy, you know. Um, I, I always say, you know, if you came to visit me as a child um, at my home, you wouldn't find me because I was under the bed somewhere if someone knocked on the door, <laughs> hiding. <laughs> oh, like a cat. <laughs> <laughs> so it's okay to be shy. It is. But feel free to um, type something in the chat if you'd like. Yeah, well, while we're waiting, I wanted to let everyone know where they can get their own copy of the book. Of course, you can borrow it from the library, but if you want to have own a copy of your very own, um, we believe it's in stock at the 57th Street, at 57th Street Books. Um, but you can also find it in your local bookshops like Anderson's Bookshop, the Bookstall, Booked, Barbara's Bookstore, or Semicolon Bookstore. Um, and if you want to buy it online, we recommend you check out bookshop.org, um, which benefits um, local bookshops. I order from them all the time. <laughs> okay, I think that's all our questions. Anything else you want to say to conclude? Well, just thank you for inviting us, Andrea. It's always fun to share. And it's even fun for me just to go back. It, you know, as we saw with Exquisite, this was a seven year project for me from idea till the book was published. And it's just, sometimes you're in it so much that you don't see the big picture of it. And it, to me, it's just beautiful to see um, mm -hmm. Cosby's work and just how it all came together. And we've called it the little, sometimes, what do you call it, Cosby? The little, the book. little book that could. <laughs> because <laughs> he, he, books come up with a lot of their own issues and problems. And we had lots of obstacles we had to um, get over to to get the book out and like they, a pandemic <laughs> <laughs> yeah the the month it came out as we and I were scheduled we were I think we were to go to St. Louis for a big um some kind of a youth program and oh, we were going to be at 57th street books to do a program some other things and then yeah we were all just sitting home <laughs> mm -hmm. wow and, and I, I want to thank um, Anne Solar for, uh, for sharing that little bit. And I know that you've got a wealth of stories from that many um, interactions with those many children over, you know, over the years. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both. It's, it's truly a special book and, and it's especially exciting for our Chicago area. Uh, people like us. So thank you so much for sharing uh, everything about your process and, and bringing this book together. It's, it's a truly special book. Thank you. Thank you. And it was a very special program. And a special um, program. We'll thank you, Anne. PowerPoint working. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime you need a quiet spot to read, you know, think of, uh, of Wilmette Library, we can be a resource to you as well. And that's a very special library, too. Thank you. I think so. <laughs>